Welcome to Still Plays Galaxy of Heroes, a channel about the struggles of work life side hustle balance. This is our talk video, and we are covering the road ahead, giving my perspective on it. So, the topics are quickly hitting the August login calendar, Darth Maul and the Executor, the Lord Vader requirements, and then we're going to get into the meat of the video and giving my take on the Relic 9 and the kit changes, and then wrap up as we do with the free-to-play gearing of my roster. We begin with the login calendar. IG-80 is the character for the month, which pretty much signifies that the executor is coming into the game in the next several weeks. We'll talk a little bit more about the executor in a few moments. The other things I'd like to touch upon in the calendar is Grand Arena. We're going to be seeing 3v3 for the month. I would prefer a Cadence where it's we're doing every other now before it used to be like every two 5v5s we get 3v3. That kept things feeling a little bit more fresh and I think going back and forth between 3v3 and 5v5 at this rate, it could cause things to feel more stale faster. Now the other thing is the galactic challenges. Sometimes I like to look at what the player faction is to see if it suggests something. Usually when new marquees are released, we'll see some sort of theming there. Biggest thing for me in the road ahead was Darth Maul. More than any other character in Star Wars, that is who I want to see in the game. And because of all the other news, I think Darth Maul has been getting overlooked. So I want to give him a moment of recognition because I'm so happy that we're going to be seeing him. And it sounds like from that video in the road ahead, that Darth Maul is going to have Mandalorian synergy. So we'll see if he is the character that unlocks the potential of the Mandalorian faction. I've taken them all up to gear 11, except for the Imperial Super Commando. So we'll see if those investments are going to pay off at all. Or if, man, uh, if Darth Maul has better synergy with different characters. Because there's one thing with the other Conquest character, Commander Ahsoka, where I felt like she was going to have a lot of plug-and-play viability, but in my testing, it really seems like Padme teams or Jedi Master Kenobi teams is really where you can use her. The other potential Galactic Republic or Scoundrel squads or Unaligned Force user squads, there's nothing really there not, that, not to imply that the Unaligned Force users had potential there. The Executor is the second big piece of information in that road ahead. And if you're a free-to-play player like myself, Fleet is very likely your biggest source of crystals. You're going to want to keep that going. And it looks like the Executor is going to be delaying me getting my second Galactic Legend because I don't think I can afford delaying this ship. There are a number of problems and frustrations I have with it. One of it being the unlock requirements. One of the things that I like on this channel is trying to accomplish as much as I can with a small amount of, in, of investment. And I know that's what a lot of the followers of this channel take as value from it. And when you have relic requirements like this, there's very little wiggle room to do anything else. You're going to see players immediately take characters up to relic eight and relic nine and being able to outsmart the other players in your fleet arena or go into your grand arenas and outsmart your opponents is going to be far more limited because you're basically forced into maxing out a fleet to begin with. The information they don't give us is exactly when we are going to be able to unlock the executor. They're saying it's a new journey guide fleet mastery. That might imply that players are going to be able to unlock it day one. That might mean it's a repeating event like other journey or legendary characters where after a year it goes into the journey guide. I think it's probably going to just be dumped into the journey guide like Beskar Mando was, but that is still left unknown a little bit. One other small rant, I don't know why they do this with the five star and four star requirements on these ships when basically any end game player has all these ships to seven stars and you, you have these relic levels that are going to be so prohibitive that even newer players going after these these characters are very likely to have these ships farmed up before they have the relic requirements. It's just kind of like a, a nonsense thing to even imply. I know there's some endgame players who ignored the TIE Bomber 
or they might not have the razor crest done but those those are the minority cases like I've I don't even know when I had the tie bomber done it's been it's been at least a year that I've had the tie bomber completed next up in this road ahead and I think before we touch on Lord Vader and his requirements just a quick note about this video it is worth watching especially for the relic 9 and kit change discussion but I Personally, I just prefer the text. I want to very quickly go through it and it was like a 20 minute video and to Take the time and sit through and have to listen to all of it. It's just a lot faster to read through these things and Especially with how careful CG tends to be with their language. I prefer to see It written so I can parse it now with these Lord Vader requirements little surprises one is Hunter, Tech, and Wrecker. Lord Vader is the first character with more than two marquee requirements. V very often it's been one, like Kenobi was one. I th think Sith Eternal Emperor was one. But Rey and Kylo, they were two. That's a surprise. Tusken Raider, a lot of people were speculating on. I decided to be generous towards CG and say it wasn't going to be required because a lot of the recent requirements have been quite generous on CG's part. Like Jedi Master Kenobi's requirements were not bad at all. So to see them require them and require them at Relic 5, like with Jedi Master Kenobi those bad relics like Qui-Gon were Relic 3s and that seem to be seem to have been a slight update on CG's end where those bad relics they kept them a little bit lower at those relic 3 requirements to go after a Tuscan Raider and get him to relic 5 is definitely not ideal Padme is not a surprise General Skywalker is not a surprise but I did speculate that Padme was going to be a relic 7 because Jedi Master Kenobi had like Yoda and I think Shakti those were Relic 7 requirements, I thought Padme was going to be in that neighborhood. And Skywalker was just, throw that relic on ahead of time. Now, this was the character I was gonna go for, but I am doing the Executor instead as my first priority. And the reasoning behind that decision, is, it's not overcomplicated. It's fleet metas don't change very often. The investment you put in there is going to last way longer and because of the competitiveness of my fleet shard it is going to be a lot easier to have an advantage there than in my squad arena and it is a certainty that the executor is going to be the new fleet meta you can't it's not a guarantee that lord vader is going to outplay Jedi Master Kenobi. It's likely, but it's not a guarantee. So until we see that, I think it's safer to go after something that we know is a guarantee. In terms of the future Lord Vader requirements, I was expecting a little bit more time between Master Kenobi and Lord Vader and thinking we were going to get another marquee character in that window. I didn't think it was going to be the Bad Batch. Uh, but now that we've seen them, I don't think we're going to see any further marquee characters as requirements. I'm going to put maybe one of those things up in one of the uh, corners for my speculation on the rest of the Lord Vader requirements. I still think we're going to see some pretty Sith heavy requirements. And so there's not really too much variation from what I was previously speculating. So I think Treya is almost a guarantee Sith Assassin is likely and either one maybe both of Scion and Nihilus I think could be very likely requirements I think we're going to be this is going to function like a Sith faction and now for the meat of this road ahead we're not going to be dealing with the particulars here we're going to be dealing with the issue and the crisis the community is currently facing so it's not that they're negating the functionality of these characters that's not entirely surprising or unfathomable. There has been conditional immunities within the game before. Is that they have allowed the functionality of these characters to exist in the game for so long 
that players have invested in them, expecting them to be there. And now they're having the dividends of those investments rescinded. And I get that and I hear that. It's a risk that exists in games like these, but being intellectually aware of those kinds of risks does not make it any easier to swallow or make what is going on any more excusable. But it's also why I say every meta expires and every investment expires, which is why I've always been hesitant towards investing in counters like these. These kinds of investments in the game, whether you're using actual money or you're using in-game resources, the only thing that you are buying is time. It's the only thing you can purchase in this game. You're either buying time in meta, or you're shortening a farm, or you're speeding up a gear. That's the only thing that you are buying. And if you understand what is going on with this nerf as an exchange of time, this is not unlike anything that has happened before. It's just that the, t the time of relevancy of these counters are ending because of a nerf instead of a character introduction. But functionally, it's the same thing. Now, a lot of you have asked, does this road ahead change anything for me? And to that, no, absolutely not. This reinforces how I play. Because when you understand everything as a trade-off, as an opportunity cost, you have to look at all the other things that you could be doing in the game. And what this road ahead does is make those other potential investments more worthwhile. Because what this road ahead has done is illustrate the risks of going after things that have a sh potential short-term lifespan. Keep in mind this is all relative and depends on your relative depth. In general, as a free-to-play player, you have finite resources and going after these non-GL counters, these niche counters, is more likely to hurt you than help you because of the opportunity cost. If you relic or increase relics to make these non-GL counters work, that means you are not relicking someone else, not gearing someone else or even a faction, or making progress towards a GL that could help against, that's a more sustainable help against these GLs. On top of that, you're increasing your GP, which is going to just increase the odds that you are going to fight these types of teams that are creating problems for your roster because the best counter to whales and the depth of their rosters and to their GLs is to manage your GP and to manage your bloat. Because not all bloat is the same. Not all bloat is lower on your roster. There is plenty of bloat that is high end. Increasing relics doesn't remove it. It can exacerbate the problem. Like today in my Grand Arena, I've faced a full Relic 7 Geo team. That is massive, massive bloat. Those Relic 7s do not help at all, and they create a massive GP problem, Why? which is why they got matched up with a player like me. My biggest problem with these niche counters is they are so likely to expire in their relevancy very quickly, faster than anything else in this game. Metas are gonna last longer than these counters. And, and because these counters have such a quick expiration date, they are far more likely to transform into roster bloat. As a quick example, I still have a Gear 11 Bastlashan, and about a year ago I made a video on my surprising Gear 11s. And one of the comments on that video was how Bastla was a non-GL counter. And I am so glad that I made do without Bastla until she became no longer relevant with the release of new characters and reworks. I forget the specifics in this case. But the lesson is the same. You're only buying time 
with these kinds of investments. It's just easier to swallow when those investments end because they don't taste like crap like a Nerf does. Things like this have happened before. This is not the first time players have come across and said, this game is dying or I'm going to quit the game or free to play is dead. I don't believe any of those things. This is unfortunate, it's frustrating, but it's not the first time this has happened. I think one of the things that might be instructive is looking at my roster versus other YouTubers that have a similar overall GP as I do. I would put up some examples, but I haven't gotten permission, and I think this would be an interesting collaboration in the future. Uh, but for those of you who want to be more entrepreneurial and are curious, it's instructive because not that there's a right way or wrong way to play the game like there's not but you can see the different choices that we as different players make and it's because even though our overall gps are similar our top 80 gps are completely different the characters we have at relics are at completely different and our top 80 GPs are completely different and even though I preach this gospel of gear 11 my intention is not to keep my GP low that's more a byproduct of the overall strategy what I'm trying to do is gear up a ton of characters because one of the things that you'll find when you look at these other rosters of other YouTubers is the characters they don't have farmed up because they were farming gear for relics or they don't have geared up because they were using that gear on relics and it creates these completely different rosters because there's like you've seen already in my in my roster the bad batch I now have hunter at six stars the rest of them at five stars except for Omega, and uh, everyone is at gear 11 with Zetas. The only reason I've been able to do that is because I have kept Chirotex for gearing new characters instead of creating relics. And it's, it's caused me to lag behind on my total relic amounts. But these new kits are so powerful. They are worth the investment. And they've given me a lot of flexibility to move forward, it's which, which is why I go after it. And you can see in these other YouTubers, they probably don't have their bad batch as far as long as me. Or some of them, like the resistance heroes, if they didn't go after GL Ray, they probably don't have their resistance heroes. Because a lot of these newer characters require a lot of Kairos. But by not taking these characters to gear 12, by not taking them up to relics, I have saved a ton of gear that I can redistribute on my roster in different ways. I've only been able to do that by not going after those relics. And by not going after those relics, I have ended up with a lower top 80 GP. And it's why I've also said, you can exist in this game without a GL for a tremendous amount of time. You do not need a GL in this game to be successful. I didn't have Jedi Master Luke in this game until April, just before May the 4th. Just before May the 4th is when I got Jedi Master Luke. I was at over 6 million GP when I got my first, G first GL. And it's because so much of my, G my GP is in fleets because of my need for crystals from Fleet Arena and because so much of my GP is in these Gear 11 characters that I have shown. And if you are a longtime viewer of my channel, you have seen how much use I've been getting out of these Gear 11 teams. And I've been receiving comments for a long time saying that this strategy is going to not be effective over the long term 
and that may very well be the case, but I haven't come across the edge of that abyss yet. And one of the things I've been doing the last several weeks to a couple months is increasing my top ADGP because I don't like my matchups. They're too easy. I want to have the challenge for the entertainment value of watching this YouTube channel. But it is effective in managing your roster because it gives you a significant amount of strength at a lower GP. So I think to summarize what I'm saying, no, free to play is not dead. This reinforces how I play this game because you cannot trust that any investment you make in this game is going to exist in the long term. So you should be trying to minimize what those investments are. And by minimizing those investments, you're going to have more resources to redistribute, redistribute around your entire roster. And for me, that has been a very effective long-term strategy. You don't need to feel pressured into going after GLs. And on top of that, uh, now that Relic 9 is coming out, is that even wherever it is on this post? With Relic 9 coming out, I've said this before when Relic 8 came out and whenever these progression systems are introduced to the game, this is good for the health of the game and it is good for free to play players because what increases in the progression system mean are opportunities to fix your roster. They are opportunities to correct for your roster bloat and allow whales and krakens to move past you. This is where going after those GLs and getting some of those bad relics, you can minimize their relevancy and their impact on your roster by now taking better characters up to that, those higher relic levels and leaving those lesser characters, let them go by the wayside. So take advantage of these opportunities. Don't rush after these higher levels. That is CG trying to trick you. I still have zero Relic 8 characters, but I have, I don't know, 130 Relic 8 materials. I'm just waiting to decide which direction I want to go. And now that the executor is in the game, that's the direction I'm going. And I'm probably going after Lord Vader soon after that. And that is when I'll be able to then take those Relic 8 materials then. But what I try to do in this game is to delay putting on materials until I feel like I have to in order to get the same performance. If it's not gonna change my performance, then what's the point? Now we're gonna wrap up as we always do with the free to play gearing of my roster. This particular footage is from a week or two ago when uh, Commander Ahsoka Tano was released in game. I unfortunately had my microphone muted during that time, so I'm gonna have to replay that footage. I'm just gonna talk over it and gonna describe what I'm doing, but it's, who knows if it's gonna sync up or make sense. I'll probably even play it on double speed too to just speed it up. So here we go with my gearing from a week or so ago. Here is that idiot right there with a muted microphone. We are starting with Omega, just getting Omega geared up to gear 11 to make her relevant and usable for that week of Grand Arena or two weeks of Grand Arena, however many it was. I didn't get a ton of usage out of her during that period because uh, she tends to die fairly quickly and the gear 11 low stars is a little riskier with Omega than the other Bad Batch characters. But we took her to gear 11, did some testing with her. She did increase the damage a little bit, but didn't really change the math. Uh, it looks like I talked about how Kiati Mundi was somebody I wanted to do, but I didn't have enough Kairos for, for him. So we are taking a look at Omega. We decided to put the Zeta on is probably what we're deciding here. I'm sure it was a good call. 
I mean, she needs those those zetas. We're watching this on a, on on two x speed, and I'm surprised how long I'm taking on two x speed. Let's speed it up, guy. Now we are taking a look at droids. What did I do with droids? I might just be jabbering about something. I don't recall what I did specifically. Maybe it was chopper. I think I did chopper. Oh, did we just put we put all the Zetas on? Okay, this is the week that I put all the Zetas on. I had been wanting to do this for a while to do some testing. So I, I put on that extra Zeta on T3M4 that adds the defense penetration. Then I added the Zeta lead to uh, IG-88, which prevents health and protection recovery on the target lock. And then I throw the Zeta here on L337, which... It kind of reads like it would help, but it doesn't because this health equalization here, it helps with the other droids. And because L3 is the one tanking, you're not taking the other droids out. So what ends up happening is just L3 dies and you're like, what the hell did the Zeta do? So it's not a Zeta I'd recommend. I would take that one back. Which I guess was the consensus, but I wanted to try it out. I thought that maybe in my particular usage, I would get some use out of it. Now, this is where I'm working on increasing my top ADGP to hopefully improve my roster. I'm being gradual about it. We are taking CLS here to Relic 5 so that I can use CLS um, in, in uh, Challenge Rancor, which... Uh, I have all the rest of the CLS team at Relic 5 minimum, so it was fairly sensible. Now I'm just making small increases. Uh, Django, I love. I mean, if we're going for... I'm tempted by Jedi Master Kenobi, but uh, he's just great at any Relic level. So I just want to boost him up, get a little bit more damage and output from him. Darth Revan, same deal. He's fine at Relic 2. What I find with Darth Revan, because you've seen it in my 3v3 and the 5v5, having them at Relics at all is good enough, and I don't find them having at having the Sith Empire at high Relics is useful, because like Gas or any team that can beat Darth Revan will beat Darth Revan regardless of the Relic level. So having... Uh, Sith Empire at High Relics is one of those sources of surprise roster bloat. Uh, trying to remove the variance in some of those counters, like the Grievous counter, will some, sometimes be a little iffy. Same thing with Daka here. Same deal. Uh, just trying to make some of these counters more consistent by making these good characters uh, slightly higher in their Relic level. Did I do Kylo? I was, I've been considering Kylo for a while. Did I do it? I don't recall. Definitely thinking about it. Nest. Did we br we bring up Nest? Yeah, Relic. The problem with Relic Two is it does. It's not really good for anything. There's a couple characters where fine you have them at Relics, but Relic 3 is where I start feel, feeling a difference in most cases, not all. Relic 1 is the same thing, we're just like, what is this doing? So it looks like we're talking about something, I'm sure. This must have been the day before Commander Soka. I had to have done Commander Soka before the sign up. Commander Soka might be in a separate video that I need to play, possibly with or without audio. Maybe I had audio during Commander Soka. But I'm talking about the other projects, the other characters I'm working on bringing to Relics. That's what Spirit and Candorous are about. And that's the video over. Now we do have audio on this video, but it's surprisingly long, so I'm playing this one on 2x speed and talking through it since we're in the middle of doing this. So Commander Soka, we activate, we gear up, 
The only things I really want to address here is I, I decided to do a couple weeks. Yeah, it was I think it was two weeks of testing Commander Ahsoka at Gear 11 to just try and get a feel for her to think to because I, I like to see for the community uh, how effective these new characters are at Gear 11 because I've shown with like Bad Batch troopers, plenty of teams are very usable, resistance heroes, they're all very usable at gear 11. And I wanted to determine if Commander Ahsoka would be one of those characters. She's fine, but her other abilities aren't doing as much damage at gear 11. She seems survivable enough at gear 11, uh, but it does make a lot of sense to bring her immediately to relics. Uh, my bigger frustration with her so far has been outside of what appears to be Jedi Master Kenobi or a Padme team she's not as plug and play as I was hoping for I was hoping she would elevate a lot of other squads but she kind of feels like Fulcrum in a lot of ways where she's there and she might be good or bad on her own merits but she's not affecting the performance of other characters on the field and that is the only frustration i'm currently f having with her where it's she's good i like her but because of how much of a fan i am of the character i wanted even more out of and now that maul is coming i'm my all my hopes are in maul i'm i'm betting my entire hopes and dreams on maul because really, it's these these two characters, Ahsoka and Maul, are my favorite in Star Wars right now. Clone, if I've said this on this channel plenty of times, Clone Wars. If you have not watched it, on the Discord I have pinned on something like I made a resource list of just the key episodes you need to enjoy Clone Wars to be able to watch the final season of Clone Wars. That is. Some of the best Star Wars there is, and you owe it to yourself to watch it as a Star Wars fan if you haven't. I think at this point, most people who are obsessed with this game have probably watched it, but I'm still trying to get my brother to watch it, who's the bigger Star Wars fan than me. He's the one who got me playing this game. When Rogue One came out, I didn't. I started playing this game after Rogue One was, was released, and uh, the holiday season, uh, when that movie was released, the entire time I was home, my brother was like, you should play the Star Wars game. You can get K2SO right now, free in game. You just gotta, just gotta start playing the game. And I didn't play it uh, during the holiday break, but he wore me down over those couple weeks where as soon as I got back to work uh, after the holidays, yeah, I was like, all right, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll download this game, and then I got hooked. I got hooked real fast, and then the, the Nihilus got released, and I think that maybe I would have been a Sith fan regardless, but I somewhat theorized that I became invested in the Sith faction because that was the marquee character that was released that was super relevant at the time for me so i think we're gonna stop did i gear anybody else up oh this is when i did chopper i was talking about chopper in the last video this is when i did chopper i use him in 3v3 a lot i'm, I'm gonna I'd stop at gear 10 in this video but i'm gonna take him to gear 11 because there we need so many teams now in 3v3 that there's an evasion team I like to play around with. It, it hasn't tri tripped up anybody in a while, but it has in the past. And we're going to wrap up here. Those are my thoughts on the road ahead. I know a lot of you have been waiting for them. Thank you for the patience on those. And I actually think that accident with the gearing might be a better way to do it. Throwing it, I'm surprised how long it was, but throwing it on the 2x speed and just me rambling over it might be much better than me talking through it as I do it in real time. We're, we're kind of going through the same information, but uh, maybe it's a 
faster and more enjoyable way for me to handle that portion. So if you think that is the case, let me know if you'd prefer the old way. Either, either way, be safe out there, everyone. Be excellent to each other. This is Still Plays Galaxy of Heroes.